of saying, can we convey emotion in HCI using thermal feedback? And we think there is reason to believe that we can, at least to a certain extent. So research has shown an inextricable link between emotional experience and both the physical and conceptual experience of warmth. In attachment theory, the physical contact and the warmth that comes with that from caregivers and, and parents is considered necessary for the proper social and psychological development of children. So if they don't have that contact, if they don't have that warmth, their development is stunted. And research has identified personality traits that are near universally considered or associated with, warm, uh, with words such as warm and cold. So a warm personality is generous and happy and sociable, and then obviously a cold personality is the opposite of that. And in fact, similar brain activations have been associated with the physical experience of warmth and the emotional experience of trust, empathy, and guilt. <coughs> so why warmth? It's been suggested that the concrete physical experience, so the actual sensory experience of warmth that we feel, for example, when we're hugging somebody, can help particularly young kids and infants to ground and process what are otherwise abstract or complicated emotional experiences and concepts. So when you hug somebody, not only is the warmth you feel inextricably linked to how you feel, but that more obvious uh, sensation helps you to understand how you're feeling underneath. And this association stays with us through adult, uh, adulthood. <clears throat> so thermal stimulation is an integral aspect of our sensory experience, and it's also a, a key component of the conceptualization and experience of emotion. So we thought it might provide good opportunities to improve and expand emotional communication in HCI, which, in the absence of Annie Sam and Annie Avatar, is still fairly limited. So we have um, kind of stylized and comical emoji um, like these, and people try to find more expressive ways of conveying emotions, such as the ASCII characters, um, but they still remain detached from kind of genuine emotional experience. Um, and in fact, there was actually a study recently which looked at uh, the range of emoji presented in different devices and different um, services, um, and the wide misinterpretations from them. So you can see these the ones along the top are all meant to be the same emoji, but they kind of vary in the level of um, apparent psychopathic tendencies. <laughs> and if you see at the bottom, the apple one kind of looks like a teeth, teeth chattering, um, whereas the rest are much more smiley. So what we have to convey emotion just now is fairly basic. So we wondered if providing alternative or additional um, emotive signals could improve communication. For example, if you're really nervous about your first ever Kai talk, and you want to convey this to somebody, you could just use an emoji with some text. But then what if you could also communicate the cold feet you have and the icy fear coursing through your veins? Would that improve communication? Would the other person better appreciate your emotional state? On a more practical level, could thermal feedback be used to improve emotional communication in digital media for people with visual impairments? So if you cannot see visual displays of emotion, could thermal feedback or other modalities help to provide that? Rather than relying on the audio descriptions of the interactions of the characters, visual displays of emotion could then be conveyed through perhaps thermal feedback. So this loving scene could be augmented with warmth, for example. So we used the circumplex model, which was described helpfully earlier. Um, so we measured the responses to the thermal feedback in terms of valence and arousal. So valence, unpleasant to pleasant, arousal, calm to excited. Um, and so the idea being that when you present a stimulus, if you get the measurements of valence and arousal and you put them together, then that kind of gives you an idea of what kind of emotion the person might be interpreting that signal to mean. Um, so we have pleasant calm emotions, like serene, calm, relaxed, excited, pleasant emotions, like <coughs> happy and astonished, excited, unpleasant emotions, like anger and frustration, and calm and unpleasant emotions, like sadness and depression. So, well, not depression, but depressing. Um, so we had the questions, what range of emotions uh, can be conveyed through thermal feedback? And how does that range of uh, thermal stimuli map to the dimensional, the, the circumflex model of emotion? So the experiment used um, Peltier devices. These white squares are um, ceramic plates which can be either warmed or cooled by passing a current through them. And we presented 20 European participants with a mixture of Central, uh, Eastern European and British participants. Um, with 16 different thermal stimuli. We started from a resting temperature of 30 degrees. Um, the skin can be adapted, so basically changed and rested uh, to moderate temperatures, so we feel no thermal sensation, so it's kind of like a baseline from which to change temperature. 
Um, and the skin is always set to 30 degrees uh, in between stimuli to, to keep the perception uh, constant. So we varied the direction of change, so we both warmed up from 30 and cooled down from there. Um, and we changed by 2 degrees, 4 degrees, 6 degrees and 8 degrees, what we call the extent of change uh, from 30. Change temperature slowly at 1 degree per second um, and also faster at a faster 3 degree per second rate. Um, and the psychophysical literature in temperature says that by increasing either the extent of change or the rate of change it makes this, the sensation less comfortable and more intense. So we were wondering how that kind of sensory perception relates to the interpreted emotionality. Uh, Stimuli were presented to the palm of the hand, similar to this, so they rested the palm of their hand on top of the pelties, and their right hand was used to, for uh, control mouse to provide the input. So all 16 stimuli were presented twice in a random order. Um, they were presented for 10 seconds, so the pelties changed temperature and remained there for 10 seconds, uh, after which they were then turned back to 30 degrees to rest in preparation for the, the next uh, stimulus. And importantly, the participants were told that the stimulus was trying to convey somebody else's emotional state. So similar to an, an emoji or a notification, they were to try to interpret what emotional state or emotional content anyway, um, the other person was trying to, to, rate, to convey. So they weren't trying to um, convey specific emotions, uh, just to rate uh, the balance and the arousal. So yeah, we varied direction of change, <coughs> extent of change, rate of change, and we measured arousal and balance through uh, textual scales. So this graph will show the average um, valence and arousal ratings for all of the individual stimuli, uh, just to give you an idea. So warm stimuli, very central, um, slightly positive arousal, um, but central valence. Cold stimuli were interpreted as slightly more unpleasant um, and slightly less arousing, but still fairly central. Uh, the slow rate of change, uh, very central. The faster rate of change was interpreted as more unpleasant and slightly more arousing, slightly more excited. Um, and as the extent of change increased through um, 2 degrees, 4 degrees, 6 and 8, it was interpreted as being increasingly unpleasant and increasingly aroused. Um, so they both changed uh, together as the extent of change increased. So this is the entire distribution. Um, you can see that. Um, which you can see is quite limited. So the red dots are the warming stimuli, the cold dots are the cooling stimuli. The numbers represent the extent of change from 2 to 8 degrees. S means slow, F means fast. Um, but generally, the overall picture is that it's quite a limited distribution, um, centered in the middle and kind of just extending into the bottom right and the top left quadrants. So the bottom left right, sorry, uh, kind of calm and pleasant emotions, um, and the top right was the excited and unpleasant emotions. So you can see generally warm stimuli are in the pleasant valence and the cold stimuli in the unpleasant valence. Um, and basically the distribution starts at the bottom right and as you increase either the extent of change or the rate of change, it moves from the uh, bottom left and moves up towards the top, right, top left. Sorry. So small and slow changes are interpreted as being quite calm, quite pleasant, and larger and faster changes are interpreted as being excited and more unpleasant. So this is going to show the effect of changing the direction from warm to cold. Um, so these are the warm stimuli, as you can see, if you then keeping the rate of change and the extent of change the same, if you were to then use cold stimuli instead, you can see a shift from generally positive valence towards unpleasant valence. So warmth is more pleasant, cold is more unpleasant. Um, this shows the effect of increasing the change by an additional two degrees. So these are the, uh, the two, the four and the six degree warm changes. And as you increase the temperature by more, it all shoots up to the top left corner, so it becomes more unpleasant and more arousing. So the same for the warm stimuli and for the cold. And there's basically the same result for increasing the rate of change. Um, so from the slow rate of change to the fast, shifts it up to the top left for both the warm and the cold stimuli. And that's to be expected. Um, so psychophysical research shows that increasing either the rate of change or the extent of change has the same effect on the internal uh, perception. It basically just increases the magnitude, the subjective intensity of the sensation. So the more intense the sensation is, not surprisingly, the more unpleasant it's interpreted as, and the more excited it's interpreted as. So if you map the entire distribution um, onto the circumplex model from earlier, 
then we can get an idea of what discrete emotions might correspond to the different thermal stimuli we use. So in the bottom right, we have emotions uh, such as calm, serene, or satisfied. And in the top left, emotions such as anger, frustration, or distress. We have a couple in the top right, um, but not very far into there, so <coughs> we're happy. And we had no uh, stimuli at all in the bottom left quadrant, which is kind of a, a common finding in HDI research. We, kind of, we can't access the corners. Um, anybody in the research will understand that reference. Um, but the eagle-eyed among you will notice that this distribution is not circular, um, unlike the circumflex model, um, which leads me on to another part of the paper, which is comparing, um, comparing dimensional models of emotion. So the circumflex says that emotions are placed on this circle around the outside, um, and emotions are continuously uh, related. So if you change one or both parameters, it moves around uh, the circle. And it suggests that the resting state is in the middle, uh, so kind of moderate arousal and neutral valence. Calm emotions require a, a reduction in valence from there. Um, but it's been suggested that the circumflex might not always be best for conceptualizing how emotions are placed along valence and arousal axes. Um, criticisms include the existence of what might be unlikely emotional states, such as very pleasant or unpleasant emotions at calm arousal. So you imagine being very calm, but at the same time feeling very um, positive or very negative. Um, it's a slightly kind of paradoxical um, emotional position to be in. And similarly, um, the presence of very aroused but neutral emotions. So emotionally neutral, not happy, not sad, but also very aroused at the same time. So it's a slightly kind of unusual state to be in. Um, so an alternative kind of conceptualization has been referred to as a, a vector model. So in this case, emotions are placed along two lines or vectors that emanate from uh, the bottom, so a position of, of calm arousal. And in this case, the resting state is <coughs> at the bottom. Uh, and emotion arousal then increases from there. And as valence changes, um, arousal necessarily increases. So this means there's no um, arousing neutral emotions like before, and there's no very calm, unpleasant, pleasant emotions. And the, the two vectors are generally associated with two different fundamental motive systems, so the appetitive or fight response, um, and the defensive or flight response. And this comes from the international affect picture system, so it's a kind of common means of conveying or eliciting emotion in a, various, in a range of fields. And as you can see, um, all you have to pay attention to is basically the shape there. So you can see it's not circular, it's these kind of two um, uh, vectors that emanate from the bottom, um, and these, the axis is flipped because the text would have been upside down. Um, but you get the idea for the, the shape. So, the circular distribution, so the circumflex, structures the experienced emotion. So it's developed and mm -hmm. measured based on how people genuinely feel and rating how they genuinely feel inside as a result of kind of thinking about emotions and becoming emotionally engaged themselves, um, or based on explicit emotional content. So, the circumflex works for that kind of stimuli, but the, it doesn't work for ratings of abstract stimuli, like, like thermal or vibrations, or even external stimuli, like the pictures from, from the international affective picture systems. Because they're less explicit, less emotionally explicit. Um, although there are these associations of temperature to emotional content, if your phone warms up or cools down, it's still very ambiguous. It's far less um, explicit than a, a dog or, or the snake in the garden uh, from earlier. So it might be that HCI ratings should perhaps be interpreted against a different model, not just the circumflex model, perhaps a vector. Um, I won't go into detail the discussions in the paper, um, but basically we looked at our data and compared how well it fits to a circumflex versus a vector, and we found that it significantly better fit the vector model than the circumflex. Uh, so rather than this kind of distribution, it could be something more like, like this. And you might wonder why does it matter? It's still all valence and arousal, still all the same. Um, but the image I showed you before, where you take a valence, you take a arousal, you map them together and you find out what emotion might be being conveyed. If you have the wrong emotion, then those points might correspond to a different type, a different emotion, a different state. So it means that you might interpret the wrong emotion. So applying a vector or other appropriate mapping to the circumflex could mean that designers are providing the wrong emotion for the person. So rather than a nice, lovely, warming scene, you could be conveying something entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to sum up, uh, in general, warmth represents positive and pleasant emotions. Cold represents unpleasant emotions. Um, increasing the thermal change by more or increasing more quickly um, represents more 
um, unpleasant emotions and uh, more excited or aroused emotions. Uh, there's a limited distribution um, as it is. We only have a small number of thermal stimuli compared to the, the picture system or other uh, types of stimuli. We only had 16, so it's just still quite limited. Um, but even the shape then is still kind of centered and, and limited. So mostly in the bottom right quadrant, so calm and pleasant emotions like calm, relaxed, or tired, and the top left quadrant, so angry, annoyed, or scared. That's me. Thank you. So individual differences in temperature sensitivity. Um, so we used a fairly, even a fairly narrow temperature range, um, one within which um, there's um, fairly uniform responses. Um, so they don't change by much. Um, the bigger issues are kind of maintaining room temperature um, because that affects skin temperature. Um, so by using the, the penalties to keep the set the skin temperature as constant temperature, it means that we can better predict or keep the, the response more uniform. Um, if we didn't do that, um, somebody could come with cold hands and their perception would be different, or they come with warm hands and be different. So that's, kind of, that's how we try and keep it as constant as possible. Hi. Hi. Um, you said um, in the beginning your, your goal was to convey emotions or that somebody could tell or get the emotions across. Do you have any ideas or thoughts on how that could work in practice? Like, how would I? Like an emoji, I could like, oh, this grinning, smiley one to to express my emotion. But I say, ah, oh, send 30 degrees, uh, the change of two, or, or do you have any ideas how that could practically work if our phones would be, um, like, uh, had them? You could, well, you could still choose something like an emoji, so you could choose an emotional category um, or an emotional label, and then on the other end, the designers would know that, okay, you, they've chosen to represent uh, fear, so you can provide the certain thermal feedback, but you can also use tactile or other things. So likely you, you <coughs> just don't choose something like an emoji, so a visual or a textual representation of the emotion you're trying to convey, or it could even be textual, so an analysis of the words you use, and you could interpret that as well. Um, so you probably have to still dictate what emotion you want to convey, um, and then it would be on the other end that the, the software would interpret how best to convey that to the person. Okay, thank you. Thank you, this was a very interesting talk. Um, if you could go back a couple of slides to just any one of your results graphs. <laughs> yeah, anyone would be fine. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the results is that there seemed to be quite a bit of overlap between the warm and the cold responses, yeah. Yeah. and that seemed perplexing given the um, given your introduction, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you account for that kind of overlap? So part of it is um, the overlap might be slightly different um, extents of change. So you could have a smaller warming change might be overlapping a larger colder change. Um, so it's kind of the intermix between the two. Um, th you mean in comparison to the emotionality of warmth and cold? Yes. It, yeah. Yeah. It's a part of your introduction. Sort of part of your introduction implied that warm and cold were very different from yeah. each other, and every t every graph that I saw showed a tremendous amount of overlap between the warm yeah. and the cold emotions both on both axes. So it, either it's partly because of the the yeah the, the change in perception based on how much you change by compared to warm and cold. It's also because the the relationship of warmth to emotion is because it's kind of related to internal emotional experience, whereas this is just your phone getting warmer or colder. So um, it could be that because you're rating external stimuli, the difference between warm and cold is different because it's very different to the internal emotional experience. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. After the session. So we can move on to the first presentation.